um, some of the cases I saw were, were interesting and noteworthy and I thought might be good examples for us all today to, to talk about. So, um, Right off the bat, one of the big laws that um, would provide protection in the workplace is, is what we call FEMLA, the Family and Medical Leave Act. Now, this is a federal law that requires employers um, to provide up to 12 weeks of unpaid leave. And it, it's provided to individuals who either they themselves have, have a serious health condition or um, who have to care for a son or a spouse with a, with a serious health condition or suffer an injury. Um, obviously, the serious health condition here is one that uh, makes an employee unable to perform the essential functions of, of his or her job. Um, it's, it's a case-by-case -case determination what qualifies as an essential function of a job. But um, that's kind of the criteria they look at, is, is whether or not, based on your own health condition, you're unable to perform that, that essential function of the job. Um, so FEMLA, federal law, does not apply to everyone. Um, it, it only covers employers with 50 or more employees, uh, public agencies, whether that's federal, state, or local, and public and private elementary and secondary schools of all sizes. So um, teachers, anyone who works in a high school or elementary school, regardless of the size, regardless of private, you're entitled to FEMLA protections. Um, so the important part of it, though, is uh, whether or not you're an eligible employee. The, the difficult thing is that FEMLA protection doesn't kick in for employees until you've been working at a place for uh, a year. And during that year, you must have accumulated about 1,250 hours of, of work. Um, that breaks down to about 24 hours a week. So if you're more than a part-time employee, and if you've been with your employer for more than a year, and if they have more than 50 employees, if they're a private employer, if they're a qualified covered employer, um, then, then you're entitled to, to FEMLA protection. Um, that, that also includes any, uh, if you are the employee, but you have a spouse, parent, or child who um, requires care for a serious health condition, you're, you're entitled to that same leave. Now, real quick, before I go on to some of the protections FEMLA offers, this is one place where I should say that uh, states typically offer their own Family Medical Leave Act protection. So in Oregon, we have what's called OFA, uh, the Oregon Family Leave Act, and that is, essentially offers the same protections as FEMLA. However, it's designed to apply to different employers, so it covers employers with 25 or more employees. Um, and it also has a shorter start time. So if you've been an employee for 180 days, then you're entitled to OFA protection. So regardless of where you're from, whether it's Texas, Massachusetts, Idaho, anywhere, um, I would encourage you to, to look into FEMLA. If you're, if you're not covered under FEMLA, I would tell you to look at your own state laws um, and see whether they offer some sort of Family Medical Leave Act protections. Um, and the, the crucial part of it, and I'll be frank, I'm, I'm typically a litigator, um, and where I see most lawsuits um, resulting out of FEMLA is the protections it offers for um, employers who try to use the FEMLA. So if an employer interferes with your use of, uh, of FEMLA, then, then they're liable for, to, uh, for, to face a lawsuit from you for, for that interference. So that's typically where we see um, litigation is when somebody tries to implement FEMLA, the employer doesn't grant it, and um, the employee then files a lawsuit for interfering with their use of FEMLA leave. So the one thing I thought we covered is uh, requesting the leave. That's kind of one of the essential parts. And there's no magic words necessary. You don't have to say, I'm an employee and I'm here to request FEMLA leave on this basis and citing 28 U.S.C. 14.72. So there are no magic words necessary. You just need to describe a qualifying reason for leave. Um, now, I'm, I'm not familiar enough with narcolepsy to, to understand what, how that might present in the workplace that might um, act as a qualifying reason. But as we mentioned earlier, the, the criteria is whether it interferes with uh, your performance of an essential function of your job. So you only need to state the qualifying reason for leave. There's no magic words necessary. And uh, you know, conversely, simply stating FEMLA, FMLA, it is not enough. You do have to provide a reason for needing the leave. Um, I actually think of uh, the office. I don't know if anyone watches that, but when Michael Scott is in credit trouble and he just goes in the middle of the office and says, I declare bankruptcy. 
And uh, Oscar later says, that's not enough, that's not how you do it. <laughs> um, so you can't just uh, shout them uh, in your office, and, and that's not how that works. But, um, but you, you do need to provide a for leave, but again, don't worry about it if we're necessary. Don't just say them uh, and, and expect to get the protection. But, um, you know, oftentimes, whether it's unclear that uh, your leave qualifies for family protection, an employer can kind of provisionally designate leave as family leave pending um, certification from a health care provider. And that's kind of where uh, the situation depends on your own health care provider's um, participation in this process. So I would imagine everyone here uh, maybe has a good relationship with somebody that's treating uh, their narcolepsy and, and they, you'd want to have them involved in this process if you're requesting leave. Um, so again, the basis for leave, uh, there are a number of other family protected leave um, options. You know, if you have a child or if you adopt a child, that might be a circumstance where you're, you're entitled to 12 straight weeks of leave. Um, but the ones we're concerned about here are for your own serious health condition or a family member's um, serious health condition. So to qualify as a serious health condition, essential job, job function, but it's important that a health care provider finds that the employee is unable to work at all or, or unable to perform any of the essential job functions um, of your position. So you're going to want to work with your employer, or your, I'm sorry, your health care provider. You're going to want to talk to them about what your job entails, what the essential parts of your job are, and whether or not on the basis of what he's seen um, from your own health condition, whether or not you're able to perform those jobs. Um, so obviously being absent from work because you're either receiving treatment or um, getting a diagnosis, anything that just completely takes you away from work is going to be considered um, as, you know, render you unable to perform the essential functions of your job. But this is, a, uh, this is an important part. And there's actually, I would encourage anyone who's interested in this to look at the Department of Labor has a form that uh, typically doctors fill out with uh, the basis for your leave, the, the reason it's required, how long this might last, um, what sort of accommodations the employer might want to make for you as part of the ephemeral leave. And, uh, and so that's something you want to look into. And I'm sure your healthcare provider would be familiar with that. Um, now, as I mentioned, you get up to 12 weeks of, of leave in a year. It's unpaid, so it's not paid leave. Um, but um, frequently, employers will say you, you're required to take your paid time off before um, you can take FEMLA leave, and that's that's not uncommon um, or illegal. So, um, you know, that might be a situation where your paid time off has to be implemented before you can get into FEMLA leave. But um, the great thing about FEMLA is that it doesn't need to be one 12 week period in a row. You don't have to take it all at once. Um, you can actually um, have it take the form of, of blocks. You can take it intermittently, you can take it on a reduced schedule. Um, it depends on your medical need and, and what your health care provider um, thinks you are able to do in terms of uh, performing the normal, you know, your normal job function, what will assist in that. So intermittently, this could be taken in hourly increments and it doesn't always have to be predictable. So I think in this, for this audience, I think that would be a really, uh, probably a really great option with, be to say, I'm not able to always make it into work right at 8 a.m., occasionally I'll just take two hours off pursuant to my family leave, and I'll do my best to notify you when that's possible and that's going to happen, but I'm not sure I always can. Um, so this is a circumstance where, you know, perhaps intermittent leave is a really good option. I think a reduced schedule would also be one that you might consider. You know, I can work Monday and Tuesday, but I need Wednesday off, and let's see how long I can... Uh, how long I can do that until I can perhaps return to work um, after I've exhausted my family leave. So that's another option to consider. You know, it doesn't have to be 12 weeks straight. It can be intermittent. It can be taken on a reduced schedule. Um, it's really up to you to work with your employer to see how that um, would best uh, work. So um, the certification process, I already touched on a little, touched on it a little bit, but. Uh, for your own employers, their personnel file, you'll want to provide them with uh, the wage and hour division's medical certification. And uh, it's, it's definitely uh, the, one of the most crucial parts is to get a health care provider to sign off on your need for leave. Uh, the, the thing is, is that an employer can require a second or third opinion on the need for leave, and they can 
pay for that by themselves, but uh, uh, they will generally, I, it's pretty rare to see that, unless uh, personally, I don't know, maybe somebody has another experience in here, but typically if you have your health healthcare provider provide a certification of the need for leave, that's going to be enough for, for most employers. Um, there is the option of requiring a recertification, of course, um, because if, if you are taking intermittent leave and it's something that's going to take, you know, a, a year of FEMLA leave in the form of intermittent leave, that's something where the employer can ask for recertification in six months and uh, talk to your healthcare provider again or ask for another certification that says this person still requires intermittent leave in order to perform the essential functions of their job. So. That's really the important part. Now, job restoration, obviously, that's part of the retaliation. So, an employer can't retaliate against you uh, for taking family leave. That might be in the form of promotions, uh, what job you have after your family leave completes, um, things like that. But I can tell you, and, and I'll just tell you from my perspective as an um, attorney, that intermittent leave is definitely one of the more complicated forms of it. Um, the simpler form is when somebody has a child and uh, takes 12 straight weeks of federal leave, that's pretty easy to understand and to, um, just as a matter of paperwork to, to fill out and you know, get job coverage. Intermittent leave is a little bit more difficult and it's a, it's a little less clear when that ends, when that ends, things like that. So you'll definitely want to work with your employer, your healthcare provider, those are really the two, um, two key groups you're going to want to work with. Um, so does anyone, I'll open it up, anyone have questions about <coughs> FMLA or questions about I just want to make a comment. Um, I have taken FMLA um, for myself and for helping my daughter who has a um, congenital condition. But one of the things I did at work was get a job accommodation so that my schedule is shifted so it's more flexible so that I don't have to take FMLA in the morning when I can't get going. Yeah. Was that a, under the uh, ADA or was that? ADA. Okay. Yeah, and that's my narcolepsy. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's, you know, that's probably going to be the biggest piece. We'll talk about it here. But, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. You're, you're right on. And, and I think she made a good point, which is that um, you're going to have options in terms of what, what sort of job protection you invoke. It might be FEMLA. You know, as we mentioned, though, it doesn't kick in necessarily for one year, so it might not be the best option for you. Um, the better option might be the, the American Disabilities Act. Um, did you have a question? Yeah, so, can you kind of just touch on it? What would your be like, let's say, I want to change a job, but now I can't, you know, if I want to move jobs, I feel like I'm stuck in this job because I'm going away and not for 12 months. What is your recommendation for that? Yeah, you know, that's a really tricky spot, I think. Yeah, I mean, by the books, I, I don't think that you're entitled to that FMLA protection when you switch employers. I think you might want to look at the Americans with Disabilities Act. So this is a, a whole different statute, passed in 1990, and, uh, oh, I'm sorry, we have one more. Sorry. Um, no, no, For the FMLA, I know you mentioned that they can't retaliate, um, and I, I don't know if this would make sense, but, like, in my job, So, um, I, um, again, I'm more disclaimer, this is not legal advice, but, um, you know, typically employers aren't allowed to, if it's a production-based bonus system or something like that, or if there's like a no-fault attendance policy, um, typically they're not allowed to um, take family protected leave into account when making those determinations. So, if you're on some sort of quota system, um, that should be adjusted to account for the fact that you took family protected leave. Otherwise, that, quite frankly, would be retaliatory, right? To, uh, right, so. Just to, to answer that, um, when I'm taking leave, I have not, I don't accrue, and, you know, like my vacation time. And so I would think, and, and my end of the year hours is dropped by that amount of leave. Yeah. Therefore, when they're calculating your bonus, it should really be on that reduced number of hours, not, and I'm not aware, so no. <laughs> I just, I'm just thinking logically. 
Yeah, I understand. So accrual is typically based on like hours worked. So it's not um, just hours in the week that you might not have done. No, no, no. I meant over whatever that time period is. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm just realizing I should repeat, remind me would you to repeat these questions for the video tape in case they can't hear you guys here. Um, but let's touch on the American with Disability Act real quick, which is uh, you know important federal law, and this is probably the one that, that is most um, uh, relevant to to folks with narcolepsy. And it's a it's a 1990 law. And what it did was essentially provide uh, protected class status to um, individuals who have a disability. It applies to all employers with 15 or more employees. Um, and you know the the key definition is qualified individuals with disabilities. Um, now there's actually a lot to unpack there, and volumes of <coughs> case law have been written about what exactly those uh, those words mean, but we'll kind of touch on them right now. So, qualified uh, means that the individual satisfies the skill, experience, education, and other job-related requirements and can perform the essential functions of the position with or without reasonable accommodation. So what this is getting at is uh, whether or not you're able to do the essential job functions and not that you're not being excluded from the workforce based on um, incidental or marginal job functions that, that might not be uh, completable on the basis of your of disability. Um, now that doesn't mean, so an example I, I typically use is that if your disability precludes you from lifting more than 15 pounds and you're going, you know, and the, the job is to be a hay baler, and uh, then that's probably, you know, being able to list 15 pounds is an essential job function and one that uh, an employer could rightfully say, well, you're, you know, you're not qualified with or without the disability to perform an essential function of the position. Um, but if it's more incidental stuff, um, if it's, you know, unable to adhere to attendance policies, um, if it's, um, you know, unable to, I don't know, stare at a computer screen for four hours in a row because of some sort of eye uh, degenerative eye condition. That's one we've seen actually. And, you know, those are the things that, um, you know, the disability won't preclude you from being employed. Um, the essential job functions, um, in the fundamental job duties of the employment position. So that's going to be really case by case um, specific. There's no broad, I can't give you one all encompassing definition. It depends on what your job is and frankly what your employer um, feels the essential job functions are. I would encourage you again get that, that employment handbook out from uh, you know brush the dust off, get it out from whatever shelf you stuck it into and, and take a look at what your job description is uh, for the job you currently have. Um, that will probably be a good um, basis for determining what the essential job functions of your, of your position are. Another one is, is think about performance reviews. Um, what are you judged on at the end of the year? What are your bonuses? Um, those are going to give you a good idea of what the essential job functions of your position are. Um, and disability, this one is definitely the um, most contentious. It's defined in general terms. They didn't provide one, uh, the Department of Labor didn't provide one list of qualifying medical conditions. Um, it's generally thought of as a person who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. Or a person with a record of such limitations, or a person who is regarded as having such a limitation. Um, so major life activities, it's a very, it's an all-encompassing list, what qualifies. But it's generally caring for oneself, sleeping, concentrating, standing, speaking, interacting with others. Um, so these are the major life activities that courts look at and determine whether or not the physical and mental impairment actually interferes with that such that um, the individual is considered disabled under the ADA. Um, I can tell you just personally, I, I, this wasn't an all-encompassing survey, but in the research I did preparing for this presentation, narcolepsy is almost always considered a disability. So I haven't seen any circumstances where a court said, no, this doesn't qualify as a disability. Everything I read, um, indicated that it was treated as a disability under the ADA. So you should be aware of that. And, uh, and I would encourage you to, to kind of think about what, what essential, uh, or I'm sorry, major life activities might be interfered with on the basis of, of narcolepsy. So what kind of protections does the ADA <coughs> offer? Well, one thing, and this is um, 
kind of important because uh, it touches on the fact that um, you don't have to have worked at a place to be entitled to protections of the ADA. Um, you're not allowed to be discriminated against on the basis of your disability, even in hiring. So um, if you're if you you require uh, a reasonable accommodation to perform the job, even though you haven't started yet, the employer is not allowed to consider that um, in determining whether or not you'll get the job. So the ADA applies, provides protection even in hiring. And we have a question back there. You know, we've had this issue come up each year that I've been for many for many years, and the issue is that uh, it's so easy for an employer to fake it, if you will, is to really be thinking it's discrimination. But saying in paper, and since they're all very sensitive now, in another way, and that's the reason why we hear year after year, everybody in this room tends to not disclose it during the interview process because of the concern that while there's theoretical productive protection, the practical protection is extremely uh, limited because unless you have a stupid employer, they're not going to document the illegal behavior. They're going to document it as listen behavior. Um, so there's a there's a lot to unpack there. Repeat the question. Yes. Good job. <laughs> so he's asking, um, you know, or rather, I think he would kind of offering that um, a lot of people with narcolepsy won't disclose this because they're concerned that um, they'll nonetheless be labeled by their employer um, as disabled, but um, they'll, they'll, there will be a pretextual basis for the termination or the, the lack of promotion or whatever discriminatory behavior occurs. Of course, they won't say this is because of the hiring. 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 Oh, hiring. And, and in the hiring. Um, you know, I guess I would say, to the extent that narcolepsy is not going to affect you in hiring, um, unless that's directly requested in a job application, you can basically announce that you are availing yourself of the ADA, as I understand it, at any time. So it's not something you would necessarily need to prevent in the, in the hiring, but in terms of requesting a reasonable accommodation, that might be a little more tricky, and you'd want to see how that plays out uh, over the course of time, months. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, let's get another question. I've been uh, recently looking for a job, and some of the applications ask specifically, do you have a disability? Now, I'm kind of at the point where I don't need an accommodation at this point, but what if I say no, and then I get hired, and eventually I get to the point where I do need an accommodation, would that be grounds for termination? Because I said on my applications, no, I don't have disabilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could you repeat the question? Yeah, so she's wondering if, if so she, uh, the job application will say, um, I do have a disability, do you need an accommodation? She'll answer that I do have a disability. No, I say I don't have a disability. You don't have a disability? Because at this point, I don't need any accommodations or anything of that nature yet. To the extent that the job application asks for a truthful answer to whether or not you have a disability, if you don't know whether you have a qualifying disability at that time, and because the ADA definition you know, basically says um, relates to your enjoy, you know, your ability to take part in major life activities. I, you know, I think there's a little bit of wiggle room there, but my my tendency would always be to um, answer a question like that truthfully if you felt like you did have a disability, and that well, whether or not you required a, a reasonable accommodation. I mean, since I don't actually need accommodation, is it considered disability at this point? But I would hate to say, you know, no, and then later on you need an accommodation, and then they say, you know, oh, you knew you had an epilepsy, but you said no, so, you know, we're not going to, or it's grounds for termination because you lied, or whatever. I just want to make sure I heard that correctly. You're saying that uh, if you said no and then uh, subsequently you requested an accommodation, would that be the basis for termination? Basically, yes. So I will tell you, I would be floored if an employer did that. I mean, I've never seen that in, in my time in employment law. And typically, people are very, not only accommodating, but also very um, concerned about litigation that would amount to, that would arise out of that sort of circumstance. So I would be surprised if you said, I don't consider myself disabled, um, and I don't require accommodation to perform this job. Six months go by, and you realize you're find, falling behind on your work, you're not able to keep up with the schedule, and you said, I do have a disability, I have narcolepsy, and I, I, I need an accommodation to perform this job adequately. I'd be really surprised if an employer were to terminate on that basis, and I would be even more surprised if 
I would be even more surprised if they were to succeed in defending that um, on that basis. So I can tell you as an employment lawyer, if I got that phone call, my advice would be provide the accommodation um, and, and work with this employee, especially to the extent that they're performing the job well otherwise, and that you want to keep this person on board. So, uh, oh boy, so well, we've got a lot of questions. I must have said something. Um, <laughs> it's definitely the hiring part, I think. So why don't we, in the very back, you had a question. It's illegal under ADA to ask a question on a paper that is a, a, a right. application. It is illegal to ask a question about disability until they offer you the job That's and right. you accept the job. If there's a form that says, do you have a disability, disregard it. It is illegal under ADA. I That's work right. with voc rehab it's in the like last years. It's like if you couldn't years. ask somebody if they're an African Muslim, anything like that. Right. So it's a protected class. Repeat the question. Uh, but the point being that you don't need to declare the disability as soon as you start work. As soon as it becomes something that's interfering with your ability to perform the job, that's when you ask for an accommodation under the ADA. And that's where it really becomes what we call the interactive process. And that's an important component of ADA compliance is uh, taking part in an interactive process um, to accommodate the disability. So um, obviously it's your burden as an employee um, to uh, announce that you uh, do have a disability that's interfering with your job performance and, and you'd like a reasonable accommodation. Um, at that point the employer has the obligation to provide a reasonable accommodation um, and what that's defined as is a change to the work environment or the way things are customarily done that enables disabled individuals to enjoy equal employment opportunities. Um, so uh, what's a reasonable accommodation? It's one that doesn't you know, involve eliminating essential job functions, completely changing the nature and character of the job, um, but one that does allow the employer um, to, uh, I'm sorry, the employee to perform the job uh, adequately and safely. So, um, now they're not, it's, it's not, necessary for them to uh, provide the accommodation you asked for if it would provide uh, or if it would pose an undue hardship to the business. Um, so undue hardships are actions that uh, you know place an, uh, a significant difficulty or expense on the business and the, that's again that's a kind of a case-by-case -case determination um, and the factors that are considered are the nature and cost of the accommodation in relation to the size, resources, and uh, structure of the employer's operation. So if you're working at a place that has 20 employees and um, doesn't have a lot of assistance, um, a lot of other employees to you know, move things around, um, or is just frankly not um, you know, able to accommodate, they'll have to prove that it's an undue accommodation, but um, it's usually smaller employees that have a, a employers, I'm sorry, who have an easier time proving that an accommodation would be an undue burden on them. Um, and again, it's determined on a case-by-case -case basis, and, and that's one reason that typically, I will say, employers will err on the side of accommodating on uh, making any accommodation that is reasonable and, and avoiding anything that could be considered discriminatory because um, there's very few clear bright lines in this area of the law and uh, uh, it's very expensive to, sometimes it's very expensive to get an answer on who was right uh, in, in whatever employment actions were taken. Um, could be six figures, for example, or more. Uh, so most employers, it's, it's generally good business to just uh, accommodate the employee uh, if they can. Uh, and again, that's, that's kind of what we call the interactive process. So if they consider the uh, accommodation requested to be an undue hardship, then they have the opportunity, or actually, frankly, they're required to suggest another accommodation. Uh, so you might say, I'd like to come in late, and they might say, well, we really do need somebody at the opposite age for X, Y, and Z reasons, but you would be entitled to take a break as soon as you need to after that. We just need 30 minutes to get the store opened up or get operations up, and then uh, I don't, you know, if you need to take an hour break, um, that's fine. So. It's an interactive process. It's one where the employer and the employee really, one would hope, would be working together to figure out how to make this relationship work and how to make the employee successful. So um, that's something to consider there. Uh, the ADA. Any other questions about the ADA? I'm happy to answer any. All right. Uh, so employer handbooks. Um, 
Again, this is kind of your, your standard uh, policies for your employer. And, you know, as we talk about the ADA and FEMLA, we, we, you know, it's, it's an unlawful employment practice for employers to discriminate against an individual based on FEMLA or um, the fact that they're covered by the ADA. Uh, your employer handbooks are going to be kind of the way to figure out how your employers, um, at least ideally, going to treat all its employees. And it might give you an idea of whether or not you're being discriminated against or whether or not the way they're treating you conforms with those policies. Um, a couple I thought I'd highlight, um, you know, we do a lot of work on, on handbooks and making sure that they comply with the law. Um, the, the handbooks we review, sometimes the employer says it's been six years since we've had an, our handbook uh, looked at by an attorney. And we'll look through it and find that it's not necessarily compliant with all the latest provisions of the law. I, I will say that employment law is probably one of the fastest evolving areas of law I've ever been involved with. I mean, you know, I can just tell you based on some uh, based on events um, in the last year, a lot of uh, a lot of federal employment laws and regulations have changed wildly um, from the time of, you know from the change of administration. So. It really has been um, a turbulent time in employment law, and uh, your employer handbooks might not always be up to date. Um, but it's definitely worth um, reviewing those and understanding how your employer is ideally um, interacting with employees. So, attendance policies. Most most employment handbooks have tenant attendance policies. Um, those will be a good way of understanding what your employer expects of you, um, whether you're expected to be at the office at 8 a.m. and anything five minutes late or more is considered tardy and will be subject to discipline under a progressive discipline system. Um, those things are typically spelled out in an employment handbook, so it's worth reviewing those and understanding kind of what the expectation is in terms of and leave policies are also a really big part of employment handbooks and having a standard way of granting leave or determining what leave is available to um, to employees. Uh, you know, the laws we covered, ADA and FEMLA, the ones we covered only apply to employers of 15 or more. Um, but a lot of employers do have their own leave policies, which are spelled out in their employment handbooks. I should. I should point out that there's almost always language in these employment handbooks to say this is not a contract um, and this can be changed at any time or without notice. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a way of advising employees about um, company policies and perhaps the rights they have in the workplace, but it's not necessarily going to be a contract, although a court would consider it um, if you were looking at why certainly it was not available to you or most other people things like that. But um, worth looking at leave policies, even if they don't have, aren't required to comply with FEMLA, they likely have medical leave, unpaid medical leave that's available to employees. They likely have a process in place for um, how you request that kind of leave. Um, what about caring for a spouse or a family member who has a medical condition? Uh, the employer handbook's a really good place to look for those things. Uh, drug test policy, I'm just flipping through one and I saw this and uh, I understand that. And I'm, uh, I'm an ignoramus on this uh, topic in particular, narcolepsy. But um, I, I understand that uh, a lot of medications might have um, and, uh, stimulants in them which could trigger on a drug screen. So um, to the extent your employer has a random drug testing policy, a policy that uh, requires a drug screen before um, employment, those are things you might want to take a look at and understand and understand how to declare a medical need for anything that might come up on a, on a drug screen. Um, meal and rest break policies. Um, so this is, you know, I, I can only speak to Oregon, but uh, in Oregon you get, you're guaranteed 30 minutes and uh, for shifts of six hours or more, 30 minutes to eat a meal and have lunch, and 10 minute breaks um, uh, for shifts of more than seven hours, um, two 10 minute breaks. So uh, your employer might have more generous policies though, and uh, it's worth looking at if you were entitled to an hour of lunch or you're entitled to a 20 minute break. So um, another thing to check out with your employer handbooks. Go ahead. Just back on the drug testing, just so you guys are aware, there's a seven panel drug testing to where it can actually test for specific medication. So, you know, if an employer does give you pushback or something, you know, it can test what you know, specific stimulants and amphetamines you're on and for the metabolites of it. So it won't just be like positive when you're 
you know, things. I said, well, it could be something like if you're on methamphetamine, you know, which is still experiment, but you know, or you know, you're like, no, I'm on this medication. They can do an extended panel testing, just so you're aware. That's so kind of specific med. And I just want to repeat that that uh, you know they have a way of setting the panel for what drugs they're testing for, um, what drugs they're testing the pre uh, for the presence of, and uh, if you declare a medication that would trigger those panels, they can remove that from the screen um, so that it, it wouldn't trigger positive. So um, definitely something worth um, disclosing and just understanding that if you have a random drug screen and you're taking medication for your narcolepsy it's probably worth getting out in front of that and saying, I, I do take this medication, it's like the chair to this, this panel on this drug test, so. Uh, but go ahead. Just kind of piggybacking on that, when it comes to, because I know a lot of people are kind of passionate about when they're looking for jobs and, and wanting to get hired when they talk about it and whatnot. Uh, the last job that I applied for, I didn't say anything about it, and then I worry about that during the drug test. And I had asked the person that was doing the drug test, because it was obviously just a, a third party company, and what they were testing. And she just told me what they were testing for. And I, I told her, who is closely related to my employer anyway, but that you know, I take Adderall and her. And she said, oh, yeah, we were testing for that. I knew it would pop up as a methamphetamine. But that way, it wasn't even something that I necessarily had to disclose prior to employment. But. That's great. That's a great example. Um, and then I guess the last thing, I mean, if anyone has questions about meal and rest breaks, but you know, I think you, it's worth looking at if an employer says, we require you to take 15 minutes, but, but we don't care when you take it, uh, actually how long it is. You might, you know, I, you know, you might have a job where it doesn't really matter what your time, you know, how long you spend in the office or what time you spend as long as you get certain tasks completed. So it's worth understanding the meal and rest break policy. Also, they might require you to stay on campus during your meal and rest breaks, um, and they're entitled to do that as long as you're completely relieved of all job duties during that time, um, but uh, I just wanted to point that out. I, I know that uh, often, I think you're looking to take naps during the day, the fatigue's overwhelming. I think that, that might be something to consider um, is what, what their meal and rest break policies are. And finally, performance and discipline policy. So a lot of um, employers do have uh, kind of progressive discipline policy. This is where, you know, it's kind of a, like a three-strike policy. Um, and, and one of the cases we'll cover, here in just a second is kind of um, illuminating, but um, you know, like your first warning is, uh, you know, we need you to show up on time, or, or we need you to take shorter lunch breaks, whatever it might be. Your second warning might be something similar, saying we're putting you on last chance um, agreement, which is where you essentially say, I, I, you know, I acknowledge this problem and uh, I have last chance to comply, and then uh, so, it, and then if you fail to comply, then in termination, but it's kind of a progressive discipline policy. And it's good to understand, I guess, in one sense, that uh, if you make one mistake, that's not going to be it. Um, uh, but uh, definitely worth looking at what kind of discipline policies your company has in place. Oh, one more question. Um, yeah, about performance. Um, most people in my position have to multitask across a lot of projects. I've had difficulty with that. I'm okay if I have two distinct projects that I sure. should split up, but it has affected my performance on and off over the years. Yeah. And that's been brought out, you know, you have to multitask better. I've never, I mean, I am on the record as having narcolepsy, mm -hmm. you know, but I can see where it affects me. So. Oh, absolutely, and I, I can't give good advice on on how that which, you know how that plays into your performance review. But it is something if you're on the record as having narcolepsy, you might discuss with whoever's doing your annual review. You might say, um, you know, I think this is attributable. This this uh, low number, this low score I got in this category of my job, I think is attributable to my narcolepsy, and I don't think uh, my overall performance should be determined on that basis. So. Definitely worth looking at these things. Um, if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to ask about this. But um, again, I would just consider it. Um, you know, I would just make a note to yourself that maybe when you get back to where you're, you know, your home, to check out what kind of policies before you have place. Um, so uh, I did. I, I looked at some case law on narcolepsy in the Americans with Disabilities Act, and one one of the more interesting ones, one that stood out to me. Dr. Honig and I had talked, and she had mentioned that uh, 
some people aren't comfortable declaring themselves as, as narcoleptics. Um, so they might try and hide that, that uh, condition from their employer. This is, uh, I thought this was an interesting case in that, in that way. So this, this woman worked at a packing plant, um, CNM Fine Pack, and uh, she actually worked the graveyard shift. And uh, she was all asleep on the graveyard shift, which regardless of any medical condition she might have is probably not that uncommon. I think if I were working, if anyone were working the graveyard shift, uh, people fall asleep. Um, but she, she fell asleep and her employer said, you know, we really need to talk about this. We can't have this happening. So um, what can we, do? you know, you can't fall asleep on the job. You need to get more sleep at home. You need to do whatever it takes um, to get enough sleep. She said, okay. It happened again, you know, a, a few weeks later and they warned her again. They said, you know, you really need to get in more sleep at home at night, do whatever you can, but you gotta stay up during your shift. Um, and uh, they even offered to put her on another shift, but because she was working another part-time job, she couldn't switch off of the graveyard shift. So finally, they put her on a last chance agreement, and uh, she once again fell asleep at, at, at the job. And uh, the, the wheels kind of started on termination at that point. So HR recommended to the vice president who ran it up to the president, and, and the termination wheels got started. In the meantime, the um, employee went to a doctor who determined that she might be suffering from narcolepsy, and that, that, that was the reason she was falling asleep and unable to stay awake at her job. Um, she actually sued to the company saying that this was discrimination under the ADA, and I think what's interesting is that the court said um, for an employer to discriminate against an employee because of her disability, the employer must have knowledge of the disability. Because CNM's decision to terminate Sperling would be before he learned of her narcolepsy, Sperling is unable to prove that she was fired because of her disability. So it's probably, I mean, if you're here, obviously you're aware that you probably have this condition, or maybe you're on a fence and trying to learn more, I don't really know, but um, to the extent you're starting to see uh, this condition interfere with your job performance, um, I know there's a real hesitancy to tell your employer about it, but I would just note that to avail yourself of some of the protections afforded by the ADA or FEMLA, I would really strongly consider uh, having a conversation with your employer saying this is something I'm dealing with and would like to um, you know, take on with you as the employer to figure out how to accommodate my job. So. Can I add on to that? Yeah, please. Um, when I first disclosed to the company, I had a pamphlet on narcolepsy. Yeah. And I turned that in with my request so that they could see what it was without sure. me going through and explaining it all. Well, and I, uh, you know, and I'll call it just one sec, but uh, I, uh, you know, my dad's a neurologist, and uh, I asked him, you know, when I found out I would be speaking here, I said, what can you tell me about narcolepsy? And he said, let me send you the up-to-date. You know, it's a kind of a medical literature that they subscribe to. Um, because I think it is generally misunderstood. Um, so I think that's something to really, that's a really good advice would be to not only inform your employer, but to tell them uh, how it presents, what the symptoms are, whether it can be medically managed or uh, with medication, and uh, what, what you expect to be dealing with in the coming years. But again, the point I just wanted to make was that, uh, was that uh, you, you know, the employer can't discriminate you against you for something that they're not aware of. And with respect to narcolepsy, I think one of the kind of, in difficult situations that it really does present as something else, right? Um, somebody's falling asleep on the job, uh, an employer might not say, oh, this is a disabled person that I need to accommodate. They might say, this person's not getting enough sleep at home. So, you have a question back there? Yes. Specifically, apply for a job. I know I have narcolepsy. I do not disclose on the application. I'm working. It is not affecting my performance. <coughs> Should I go to HR and just say, look, I'm just telling you I have this. I do not need any reasonable accommodation now just to take care of what you just presented there because then they have knowledge and it should just stay in personnel file? That's, good. That's a good question. Could you repeat the question? Yeah. <laughs> so he asked if it's, uh, if it's not yet affecting your performance, you're aware you have narcolepsy, uh, but it's not affecting your performance, should you nonetheless let your employer know about this condition? I will say it's likely to come up um, at some point that the employer would send around a questionnaire for ADA compliance saying, do 
you have a disability that we, sh we should be aware of and do you require reasonable accommodation. Uh, again, this, uh, this case is unusual in that the, the person was discovering that they were likely suffering from narcolepsy. If you're aware that you have it, um, I wouldn't, you know, this is a personal decision and I don't want to give advice either way. I think there's, I, I, I think it's a personal decision whether you disclose that and I know that people have strong feelings about whether they do that. Um, my only comment to, to aid you in making that decision would be to say that, uh, you know, your medical information is, is protected under the law and that your employer is probably not, I mean, certainly should not um, disclose any medical information that you provide them. It should stay with a narrow subset of management um, and whoever you tell, maybe it's just someone in HR who's responsible for ADA compliance. So um, to the extent you're on the fence about it, you're worried about everyone finding out, your fellow employees, um, just know that there's there's protections um, and privacy rights for medical information that you disclose to your employer. I do want to touch on two more cases, and then I'm happy to stick around and answer any questions you have. But the one I, I just thought, you know, I guess you guys won't mention by now, but um, Wheeler versus Jackson uh, National Life Insurance Company. This was a case where the person had narcolepsy and some other comorbidities, and um, asked for an ADA accommodation of working from home. The employer just explained that um, he really, the employer really didn't need them in the office to log into a certain uh, technology or software because they were FINRA, you know, uh, FINRA regulated um, because they were selling securities or something like that, and so they couldn't reasonably accommodate um, allowing this person to work from home. Um, it's unclear whether they offered other accommodations to allow this person to continue the employment, but the court found that uh, because of the nature of the job, actually being present was uh, essential to it. Um, so real quick, FEMLA and the courts, um, Waters versus, this is actually an Oregon case, and uh, it's kind of a, it's an interesting case in that the woman was um, declared that she had narcolepsy and was given intermittent leave on that basis, and she subsequently, um, the, the intermittent leave was scheduled to last for a year. Um, after that year was up and conceivably the FEMLA protections ended, she then requested uh, additional leave related to, again, her narcolepsy condition, although she didn't style it necessarily as FEMLA or OFLA leave, Oregon Family Leave Act. Um, the court found that uh, a jury could, jury could find that uh, a reasonable employee with knowledge of her previous history of narcolepsy could have understood that um, her request for additional leave was a request for um, leave covered by FEMLA. So um, I felt like, to me, one reason I wanted to highlight this is just, it felt to me as another example of where you're able to avail yourself of the protection of the law um, for you know either your serious health condition or um, a disability if you're um, communicating with your employer that you have this and that you, you want to work with them and figure out how to how to continue performing your job um, under those circumstances. So again, uh, it's a personal decision. I won't tell anyone what to do, but uh, I just wanted to make everyone aware of, of these kinds of cases and what we typically see in, in, in courts. And so I'm happy to answer any questions. You've got my contact information up there. We are at 1150, uh, or I'm sorry. <laughs> 250, um, <laughs> on quiet time or something, but um, I'm happy to take a question, but if anyone wants to get up and go, anyone? Can I just share something with everyone? Yeah, she wants to share. Um, there's this website organization called the Job Accommodation Network, and right. it's askjan.org, and they have a whole set of accommodations for, specifically for sleep disorders, and they actually have a whole other sheet for people with cataplexy. Did you say narcolepsy and cataplexy? Well, they have the one sheet is for sleep disorders in general, but then they have a whole other accommodations for the workplace, specifically for people just with cat. Well, I mean, you would be narcolepsy yeah. and cataplexy, but they have specifically for cataplexy, which really surprised me. But it's just a giant list of um, employee accommodation suggestions. It was really beneficial to go through, and it goes over the ADA stuff and, and many of the things that you touched on, but it's just a big list of that's, ideas that you can take the words of the That's, I'll, I'll, that's yeah. the Job Accommodation Network. Yeah. It's abbreviated as GM a lot of the time, but uh, she was just pointing out that uh, the Job Accommodation Network is a list of accommodations, reasonable accommodations for people who have that city or an That's Thank you for sharing that. We actually have to stop it, um, and we can go and we have some more time.
where we have the closing session started. And I know a lot of you, you said that we have to change. So, um,